All right, so Pope Mike's introduction. So we're, we're going to cover a bunch of things in this session. So what is open access and what it provides and projects and how to open access and how to access open access and how to use it pretty much. So we're just going to start here. What is open access and what it provides? So we touched so I found this in the previous lecture, and I was a bit confused about which lecture I was giving. So Uppsala is the, or Upmax is the Uppsala Multidisciplinary Center for Advanced Computational Science. And we have three clusters at the moment. So we have Rakam, the one that we've been working on this morning. It has about 500 nodes. And node is the same thing as the computer. And they talk about these classic computers. So it's 500 computers, ordinary computers. You couldn't go and buy this kind of thing at a complex or a Van Halen. So it's not special magical hardware, it's ordinary computer things. They are a bit beefier than your ordinary computer. So I mean, your laptops, you probably have uh, maybe four cores in each laptop, whereas these computers have 20 cores. And a core is pretty much CPUs. Modern CPUs have multiple cores in them, that means well, I think it was in 2002, the first dual, dual core processor was released. Before that, they only had one single compute core in a CPU. So you could do one type of calculation for one program could use the core at one time and had to take turns. But then as you started to get these multi-core processors, you could have multiple programs all using uh, one core each. It's kind of like having more people work for you. So if you buy a phone now, they're probably like octa core or hexa core. And yeah, your laptops is quad core computers, the CPUs. And if you look at RAM, uh, our computers have about 128 gigabytes as standard, whereas your laptop probably has eight, 16 if you're lucky. And we also have the high memory nodes, which is 256 gigabytes or one terabyte of RAM. And we also have our old cluster called Snowy, it used to be called Melu, when it was uh, our main bioinformatics cluster. It's from 2013, so it's a bit slower, but it hasn't happened that much in the CPU market since then, so you know, it's pretty quick. And it usually has a shorter queue than Rackham, so it's a good place to run your calculations on. It has 200 nodes with only 16 cores each, so it's slightly smaller, but memory wise, it's roughly the same. The standard is 128 gigabytes for the nodes. And we also have the Bianca cluster, which is our sensitive data cluster. So that's where you can keep all human DNA, living humans, I think it's the invitation. So if you do ancient DNA, you can have an outcome as well. If you have GDPR sensitive data, then you have to be on Bianca. It's a bit smaller since we have more projects not using human data than uh, human data. So the 200 nodes, 16 cores each, and I think this is roughly the same generation as uh, that Rackham cluster, so they're pretty much the same speed. Memory-wise, pretty much the same. It's set up behind the scenes in a very special way. It's virtualized clusters, and every project is isolated, so you can't see each other. You have to keep your data safe from each other. Whereas on Rackham, everyone can see pretty much everything, unless you specifically say here, no one else is allowed to see these kind of things. And connected to all of this is the storage. So the storage is what sets Upmax apart from all the other supercomputer centers in the Swedish academia, is that we have all the storage. I mean, if you look at NSE, a couple of years back, they, I went there for a tour and they were like, yeah, this is our storage track, we have, we have almost one petabyte. Oh, okay, so uh, for one project, or as our biggest project is the Spruce project, which I think they use one and a half petabytes of data or something. Crazy. And they were super proud that we have one petabyte. <laughs> so other disciplines are not as data intensive as bioinformatics is. So yeah, I think it's not uncommon that a small project in bioinformatics is a couple of terabytes worth of data. Whereas in physics, you have you know, kilobytes or megabytes. It doesn't have to be any size at all, almost. And we also have lots and lots and lots of software. And yeah, we'll dig into the software part a bit later in the lecture. But yeah, we have lots of programs installed. So you don't have to install your own programs. So you're going to save lots of time. So the basic 
structure of one of these supercomputers or cluster computers is that when you first connect to it, you're going to arrive at something called login nodes. And if you looked at command line this morning, it usually said Rackham 1 or Rackham 2 or Rackham 3. Those are the three login nodes we have at Dopemax. So all users connected to Dopemax will go through one of these computers. And then we did this SRLock command to say that I want to have my own computer. And we checked which one we got by using the SQ command. And then we typed SSH again to R11 or 31 or whichever number you got. And those are the calculation nodes. So they are identical computers. It shouldn't matter which one you get. Only the name of the computer will be different. Otherwise, they're almost pretty much the same, the same CPU, and they all have access to the same storage usage, which is not on the computers themselves, but on this like network storage. So our project folders so slash pro is located here. Your home folder is located here. All the nodes here, they do have hard drives and they have their own operating systems and everything and you can use the hard drives in the computer if you want to do a very disk intensive uh, analysis that's going to read and write to files all the time it's going to be slower doing that over the network because it's, you know, it's longer to the network storage so you might have a couple of milliseconds delay whereas if you do it on the hard drive itself it's going to be like a tenth of the delay so if you run that, those kind of analysis you really want to use the hard drives on the nodes themselves but if you also do that kind of analysis, you probably know how to read the guide on the OPAS homepage and how to reach that. It's in slash scratch, it's the local hard drive of the nodes. So it shouldn't matter which computer you're on, you'll get a random one every single time. But you don't want to run your analysis here on the login network. You want to run it on the calculation nodes. Otherwise, you're going to be disturbing all the other users. A cool thing you can do on, what's your name? We can do it right now. If you connect to uh, Rackham, I have a small uh, macro to connect to Rackham. Uh, if you type, actually, that's the staff node. If you connect to Rackham 1, what is this? <coughs> if you type the command who, you will see a list of all the users that are logged into this node at the same time as you. And you see there, there's a bunch of people running on the same login node there. So if we were to start running analysis, we would be stealing resources from everyone else and making this node really slow. And maybe some of you try this out through the lab. We can count how many users there are. This is not unique users because you see some people have multiple terminals open, like you should. But there's 166 connections to this node alone. So you can imagine what would happen if people start running their analysis here. If we check the top, we can see that no, not very many people are running analysis. There are no 100% CPU problems running. Yes? Could you please increase the size of the Oh, sorry. We're going to Yeah, so if you did work count on the number of users, 166. There's another program, it's not installed by default in the system, it's called HTOP. Because top, that's kind of boring to look at. With HTOP, you get colors, and bars, and stuff. Kind of you can see, okay, so here are all the CPUs, and here's some memory being used. And down here, you have the list of all the pro programs running. So, back to the lecture. So, that was just on one single login node. <coughs> and yeah, so we are called the compute and storage part of Envis, where I work. And it's overlapping with Opmax, so the staff working here is like work part time for Opmax and have part time for uh, Envis. So a supercomputer, it's, it's not really supercomputing that you have a super fast computer that will do your analysis super quick. It's called parallel computing because you have multiple computers all running in parallel. So it's still the same amount of calculations being done. But since you spread it out on multiple computers and each computer calculates one part each, you could do this on a sample basis. So if you have a thousand samples, look at a thousand computers that each analyze one sample each. You will not have, only have to wait one hour instead of having to wait you know, two weeks for one computer to finish all your samples. 
this is the, the easy part of uh, parallelizing when you have separate samples. Otherwise, you will have to have special programs that can uh, spread data across multiple computers. And it's not very common in bioinformatics that the softwares can do that. So we're, we're usually locked to one single computer in bioinformatics. So projects at OpenMax. So you're all members of the course project. This is SNCC 2022 22769. But what if you want to get your own? So after this course is finished, you want to do your analysis of your data, then you have to get a project first. Since projects are the only thing that have resources at OpenMax. Users, we don't have resources, we have a home folder. If you want to be able to use the calculation power of OpenMax, we have to have a project. And the two resources we have is core hours and storage. The storage is measured in uh, gigabytes. So when uh, yeah, you get a piece of the storage and a piece of the calculations, when you get the project. So for some reason, they thought it was a good idea to have two separate projects. So one for storage and one for calculations. Uh, Five years ago, you only had one single project that had both. But I guess they wanted to double the amount of administration I have to do, so <laughs> they decided let's make it two projects. Yeah, so when you get one of these default calculation projects, you get it on rack count. The default size is 2000 core hours and 128 gigabytes of storage. This is plenty for a physics project, they don't need more storage. But for bioinformatics, you need to have one of these storage projects. And I think the, the default size, I don't think it's one terabyte, but it's like half a terabyte. But then you just say, I want to have two terabytes for storage, and then you say, okay, no problem. This one cannot change. It's always 128. And if you fit within that, perfect. That's what we do in this course. We only have one calculation project. So we only have to remember one of these SNCC 20, 22, 22, 769 numbers. It gets confusing quite fast if you have multiple and have two of each. So to apply for one of these, you go to my home page. You could go to super directly or you go here and click apply for an account or project. Then you will get to this page which is like getting started with Upmax that describes <coughs> everything you need and everything. you already have your user account so you don't have to go to that page. But you can go to this project application page instead. And here it says, okay, so this is how you apply for uh, projects, a long guide on how to do that. And then when you actually want to apply for it, you take this link, just like three clicks. Together. Then you will be ported to the super uh, portal where you apply for a membership. And I think this links go directly to uh, how to apply for a project. And then you just decide which type of project you want, and you describe it a bit more and your details. And uh, you probably will have a project within a week or so. Because, yeah, especially now we have to go through all the projects pretty extensively because we're, we recently got more storage, but before that we were really tight on storage. So we had to start prioritizing. So we had a list of projects and we can only give uh, projects to half of them. The other half would have to wait. This is, which is a shame because you, you, know, you spend a lot of money on sequencing and then you don't get time on the cluster. That's what you get when you buy sequencers instead of storage systems. And everything stops. So on how to OpenMax, access OpenMax. We did this this morning, the SSH command. So SSH stands for a secure shell connection. So this is pretty much the same thing as going to the computer room at OpenMax and connecting a monitor and a keyboard. But you don't have actually have to go there. You just have the terminal to connect. So you'll say SSH dash capital Y to enable graphical transfer, but we're not going to be using it in this course. I think. And your username at OpenMax at the cluster name, so that come in this case, opmax.ue.se. And once you're connected, it should look something like this. Have your SSH command up here. And now you see that you're on that company. So when you first open a terminal, that terminal is running on your computer. If you create a file, it's created on your computer. If you delete the file, it's deleted on your computer. But as soon as you SSH, it's on a box. 
So all the points created R and F max and all the points that you did R and F max. And then later on you will end up on one of the calculation nodes. So all the commands you run is going to run on the calculation nodes. <coughs> yeah. So run all analysis on calculation nodes. So how do we get the calculation nodes? It's these S public command and S Q to see which one it works. So all these commands, they start with an S in the beginning. And that's because we have a Q manager called Slurm. They named all their programs with S in the beginnings. So jobs and queues, I talked a lot about those. So what is it? So if you look at the definition of Wikipedia, what is a job within computing? And it's a unit of work or unit of execution that performs that work. So it's pretty much whatever you do on the computers that you have booked during the time that you have booked them. If you want to run a program, that's fine. If you wanted to stand idle doing nothing, it's also a job. We don't like it, but I mean, every, everything we do in these labs are pretty much going to be 95% doing nothing. And then you're going to be running one single command and then you're going to be sitting reading. But that's fine, it's education. But when you run your analysis in the future, we're going to be a bit harder and looking, okay, so what are you actually doing on the resources? And yeah, at the end of this lecture, I'll show you some tools where you can check if you're using the resources efficiently or not. So this is usually what happens inside a job, that you open or read some kind of file, you do something with that data that you read, and then you save the results somewhere. And we have 500 computers, but um, 2,000 users. So we can't just give everyone one computer each. We have to have a queue. And queue systems are, I mean, there are people doing PhDs of parts of queue systems. So it's really like an optimization problem. And we don't have to take that into account because we just say, I want to have one computer for one day. And then the queue system will just figure that out. It will try to find where can I start that job? So let's say that the queue looks like this right now. This computer is booked until tomorrow. These ones are also busy right now. These are free right now, but in a while, in 12 hours, there can be something starting. So if we want to start one single computer for this amount of time, we could start directly on either of these, but we can't start on these. I mean, they're free right now, but our, we asked for a job, but it's too long, so it's gonna collide here. So the queue system will take our order and see, okay, I'm just gonna start it directly on one of these. If you ask for something that is wider, that is not possible to start right now, you might have to wait until tomorrow. Because then the queue will see, okay, so these are free right now, but if you wanted five computers, go on, you just have to wait. And I wanted it for too long, so it doesn't fit here. But that's the beauty of queue systems. You just send in your job, then you go home. If it starts in the middle of the night, that's fine. The queue system will handle all that for you. So the one that we're on is called Slurm. So that's for simple Linux utility for resource management. It's a nice free open source queue manager. <coughs> it can be called many different things like workload manager or batch queue and job scheduler. It's all the same thing. So there are mainly two different ways of using Optimax or Plastic Computers. And one is what we're doing in this course this morning that we're asking for resources and then we sit manually by the computer and type all the commands. It's good for testing. It's like if you don't really know what you want to do, but you know you want to try it out. Maybe you don't really know how a program works. You just want to test it for a while. Then it's good to sit there and run things manually. So then we do what we did this morning. First we book a node or a core, then we SSH to that node, and then we run the programs. I'm going to do all of this manually, just type the commands. So we run this S alloc. The S stands for slow room, and the alloc stands for allocate. So we want to allocate resources. And then there are a couple of options you have to give it here. So the dash capital A option, and P, M, and T. And they mean different things. So A stands for account, P is partition, M is the number. Time. So look, 
here, for instance. So A account. So we have this project ID. When you get your own account, this is going to change. You're going to have a different number here. And you have to be a member of this project. And this is the only option that is actually mandatory when you submit a job. You have to say who's paying for it. Where should it uh, put all the core hours? And it's not money, since all the resources set up myself for free. But we have to be able to share the system fairly. And then we have these allocations that you're allowed to use 2,000 core hours every month. It doesn't matter that much if you use more. The only thing that happens is that you get slightly lower priority in the queue. So you might have to wait until uh, in the middle of the night before the job starts, or maybe during the weekends if it's really busy. But you can definitely continue running. I had a project that had a 2,000 core hour limit, and I think I used 500,000 core hours in a month. So it's not a problem to use more than your allocation. You can't really say the same thing about storage. When you run out of storage, you run out of storage, and then everything else stops. And this key option, the partition, it's like a queue system technicality kind of thing. You can divide your cluster into multiple parts. You could have named it physics, bioinformatics, and mathematics and say that only the physics projects are allowed to run on the computers that are in the physics position of the cluster. And bioinformatics is only allowed to be in the bioinformatics part. And then you can say that bioinformatics is, you know, we have lots of users, we should have twice as many computers. And then you can balance your system that way. Uh, at Opmax, it's divided into nodes and cores. So it kind of decides how big a big chunk of computation do you want. Like, do you want a full computer with 20 cores, or do you want only one single core of these? And that com comes down to this uh, core hour thingy that okay, you're allowed to use 2,000 core hours per month. So if you have one core for one hour, that's one core hour. If you have 20 cores for one hour, 20 core hours. So the bigger your booking here is, the more core hours your job is going to cost. But yeah, the more calculation power you're also going to have. Then you're going to have 20 compute cores so you can run theoretically at 20 times the speed. So if you say that you want a node, you will get at least 20 cores. If you say that you want a core, you have to decide how many cores do I want. You can have one or two or three or all the way up to 20. Yes. Depending on what you want to do, you should not use multiple cores, but rather put one core for longer. Is there something like a comprehensive guide on for which processes you should rather use many cores in shorter times or the other way around? Uh, <coughs> yeah, so for the, the people on Zoom, if you, I don't know if you hear the questions, but the, the question was, uh, is there any way to know if you should book multiple cores or if you should book one core for a longer time? And uh, the answer is, yeah, you just have to try and see. So you can measure how well a program scales. That's if I double the amount of cores, do I run the program in uh, half the time? And you can measure weak scaling efficiency and strong scaling efficiency and a bunch of metrics. But yeah, the only way to know is to try. The first time you have no idea. So book you know, a whole node for a whole week and see what happens. And then you look at some plots that I'll show you how to generate later, and then you'll say, OK, maybe I should run this on one single core. But most of the times, it will say in the instructions for the program if it can use multiple cores or not. Usually, there's an option specifying how many cores should I use. And if the program has that, yeah, then you, then you can start experimenting and see how many cores can I book and how well is it scaling. So that's if you're going to run, you know, a million samples, we kind of want you to know what you're doing and uh, design your jobs in an efficient way. So not, you know, we don't care if one job is inefficient. We care if how the jobs are. Yes? Uh, like when you overestimate the booking time and the job finishes early, it only counts the, the amount of time that the job is running or everything? Yeah, yeah if, if it crashes after one second, you only pay for one second. So always overestimate. Because if you don't overestimate and you run, you know, if it's only one millisecond left for your analysis to finish, we get a job instantly. The time is up. It can't really check and see how long is left. So then we count it as one time you're trying to steal resources from other people, then we'll strap everything now. Yeah, and the time is specified in hours, minutes, seconds. We can specify the number of days. So 
This is a week, seven days, zero minutes, zero hours. And then when you want to see information about your jobs, you can type SQ. If you just type SQ or press enter, you will see the whole queue of job points for all the users, or at the cluster you're connected to at least. If you want to filter this list down because you're not really interested in all the jobs, you're interested in your jobs, you can add this filter. So filter on username, and then you type your username or someone else's, and then you will see only those jobs. You can also filter on the capital A, so account, so show me all the jobs being run in this project. So you can filter on a bunch of stuff. And so if you want to go to the calculation node that you booked, you can use the SSH command. Remember to also have the dash capital Y, otherwise it won't work. Every single SSH connection has to have this capital Y for graphical transfer to work. So just try to make it a habit to always use that. So if we do this S alloc booking up here, say I want to have uh, one core for five minutes, you see, okay, so grant the job allocation. Then we run SQ. We got this printout saying there are one job running. It's running on this node, M164. And we type SSH dash capital Y M164. Then we're going to end up on this node. So now we can start running heavy analysis and we will only disturb ourselves. We're no longer on the government. <coughs> There's another program. I think it only works at Docmax or the other Snake Centra here in uh, Sweden. So it's not like a widespread program. It's called Interactive. It's a small Perl script. It will run as alloc for you in the background. But it adds a couple of features. One is that you will have a higher priority in the queue when you submit it to this interactive command. And it will connect you automatically to the node that you got. So you don't have to check with SQ and you don't have to SSH manually. It will do it automatically. So this is good to use when you're on the SNCC systems. If you go to some other cluster somewhere else, it's probably not going to work. Syntax-wise, it's exactly the same as s alloc SQ, dash A and dash P and P and so on. So then maybe the second way, this is probably the more common way if you look at the number of jobs being run at Docmax, and that is that you don't sit by the computer when the job is running. You write down all your commands in a file and tell Slurm, I want to run this file on a computer and I want to have that computer for four hours. Then Slurm is just going to take this file and if we just start reading from line one, okay, is this a command I should run? And it will run it. And when the file is finished and there are no more commands, it will just shut down the job and it's finished. So it's kind of like, imagine that you want to run an analysis and you write down all the commands on a piece of paper and you give it to a five-year-old. They should be able to run your analysis for you. They're just, they're probably not going to type it correctly, but yeah, in theory. So, and this is called writing a script. Then everyone's like, oh, script? I write a script? It must be complicated. And, you know, it's not. It's exactly the, the same commands you would have written if you were sitting by the computer. This is a script. It contains uh, the, the first line here, the hash bang line, tells us so which program should be used to interpret all the lines down there. Then we say, I want to use bash. Then we have this dash L option, which we have to have on Opmax, otherwise, we won't be able to load any software. So just copy paste this part all this every time. The first couple of lines here that all start with S batch, those are the only lines that Slurm will read. It will not read the remaining lines. So it will only check that if you have an error errors up here. So you give it all the options here. So S batch dash capital A. So this project is paying for it. It's a core we want to run it on. This dash capital J is a job name. So they will name this job by unique name. We can name all our jobs the same thing. So we don't really care about it. It's more information for us. So if you're running a thousand samples, I recommend you name your jobs after which sample you're analyzing. So that you know that if a job crashed, you know instantly which which sample is affected or not. It's just a good way to tell them apart. Otherwise, you only have a randomly generated number. This is a job ID. Then you have 
time, so eight hours in this case. But then you have all the bash code. So bash is the thing we've been practicing all morning. So CD and LS, CD, MD. Those are all bash commands, shell commands. So usually in a script, you go to some folder where you have your files and you do something. This <coughs> is, it runs the hello command, which just echoes back whatever you type to it. So here are the job parameters. And here are the tasks to be done. A bit more realistic will look something like this. You CD to an absolute path, since you never really know where you're going to be standing when you run the script. And then you run some kind of software. In this case, it's a top path, which is a of an ancient or an AC to a minor. You tell it to use eight processes or eight cores, specify a reference genome, and your FASTQ file where you have your reads from the sequencing facility. Then once you've written this to a file, you will use nano or some other editor to write this to a text file. Then you submit it. And that you do with a command called sbatch. So this is a batch job. And it's a slow command, so they name it with an S in here. So just type sbatch, name of the file you want to submit. In this case, it's named test.sbatch. It could be test.pp long sockets. So we won't really care about file endings. If you have options written inside a file here, all of a sudden you want to change those options. You could edit the file and change it. But if it's just a one-off, maybe you want to name it something else or run it at a different project, you can overwrite the settings in the file by giving them on the command line. So if it's only the account you want to overwrite, just give it the dash A listing. And if you don't give the rest here, it's just going to use whatever is in the file. So this is just for temporarily overwriting the options that are written inside the file. So we have 500 computers at our account, but we don't have 500 screens. So where does it print all that program wants to print during its runtime? Run and the answer is it prints it to a file instead. So that file is going to be named slur dash whatever job ID number you got dot out. So if we're standing here in our temp folder, we we'll look around and see that we only have one single file here. It's called test.spatch. And we do this sbatch command to submit this file to the queue system. The queue system will look at the first couple of lines in the file, all the sbatch lines, and see that, okay, so there's nothing uh, wrong here, so I'm going to submit this job. And it will answer back saying, submit a batch job, and that is random number. And this is your job ID. And if you <coughs> wait a while and look again, with LL, you see that, oh, now there's a new file created here. It's called slurm dash, and then the same number is up here dot out. Then we use the cat command, which would print this whole file directly to the terminal. So if you do cut on this slurm out file, we can see that it contains one single thing. It says this goes to the slurm job ID out. So then if we look inside the sbatch file, what, what was the job? What did we submit? We can see that we have all the sbatch jobs in, up here. Then it will go to a folder called uh, my whole folder slash work, the number one echo. This goes to this your new ID out. And it's going to run another echo command, but it's not going to print this to the screen because we use this redirect symbol here. So it means don't print it to the screen, print it to a file instead. So that's why you only get one single line up here, even though we have two echo commands down here. So this sq command that we used a couple of times now, there's an alternative that is also, I think, only on the SNIC systems. It's called job info. It works exactly the same way as sq, but you get a bit more information. Uh, it gives you information about how much time is left on the job. And if your, queue, uh, if your job is still waiting in the queue, it will also show you which position in, in the queue your job is. So you know if you're position 10 or position 10,000. And you can kind of estimate how long time it's going to take until it starts. And well, this slow music guide that opens my own page, which specifies some tips and tricks. You might not read it from start to bottom, but if you have some problems, maybe you can go there and search and see if someone else has asked that question before. So then we have 
this software that I talked about before. So I have lots of bioinformatic programs installed on Hilfmax. Like I think it's 700, I think was the latest number I heard. So they're all managed by something called a module system. And that means that the computer won't know about these programs. It's kind of like they're not installed until you load the module for that program. Then all of a sudden the computer can find that program and run it. But they're always there and this module load is instantaneous. It doesn't have to you know, run an uh, installation script or something like that. It just shows the computer where it's installed. There are a couple of commands you should know when it comes to the module system. It's this module avail, which prints a list of all available modules or all available softwares. And once you find the one that you want to load, you like module load, and then the name of it. If you change your mind, you can always unload it. And then module list will just show you which ones you have loaded at the moment. And you can use the module spider thing. They should just name it module search instead, and you will know what it does. It's the search function for the module system. That if you know the name of the program, maybe, then the spider thing will try to find it for you. So in physics, they have like four softwares. They all run uh, Gromax or uh, some Monte Carlo thing. And maybe they get a new version every second year or so. In bioinformatics, we have you know, hundreds of programs and they all re release new versions every month. Since everything is you know, cutting edge and everyone wants to be the latest. It hasn't really stabilized the same way as physics has, which has been running on these kind of computers since the mm -hmm. 60s or so. So they were a bit upset. When they type module available, they can only see bioinformatic programs. So big wall of text, and they couldn't find their own programs. So they asked us if we could hide all the bioinformatic software because it was just too much. <coughs> so we did. So we hid it underneath a module. So before you can load any bioinformatics program, you have to load the bioinfo tools module. So we see here, if you try to run module load cufflinks version 1.2.1, it will say, oh, there is no such program. And find a module file. But then, as soon as you load the bio info tools module, then it doesn't complain anymore when you try to load this. You don't have to do it in two separate module loads like up here. You could do it in one single one. So, module load, bio info tools, sound tools, and that will work. Let's make sure that bio info tools is the first one, otherwise, it won't work because it will try to load them in the order you did it. So, this is how it looks when you type. Module available after running load bio info tools. This list goes on for many, many pages. I should just find out how many. You know, it's going to bring that up when it takes some time to load up. So this is the first page. So Twenty-five pages, I think. Yeah. So lots of programs installed. Now you can see there are multiple versions of each program as well. Since maybe you wrote your pipeline to work, to work with version 4.1.0, and then maybe it broke in a later version. Can you make it a little bigger again? Yes. yes. Zoom up. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> now it's going to be even more pages. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But then, of course, you would do with the uh, since you're lazy, you don't want to do that. And just tell the computer, can you please count this for me? No, it didn't. It's probably printing it. You know. It looks the same, but uh, a computer program can print to the terminal to, to two different channels. It's called it's the standard out channel and the standard error channel. It seems like modern system prints it to the standard error channel, but you can redirect it so that I do this, I think. Oh, it didn't work. Am I? 
we go, lots of programs. <laughs> so there's another pro uh, program called uQuota, stands for Opmax Quota. So it's outside Opmax. It just shows you how much storage are you using and how much are you allowed to use. So if you print this, it will print out for all the projects that you're a member of, it will print out how much you're using and how much you're allowed to use. So you can see that, okay, so maybe we're approaching the limit on this project, maybe you should contact Opmax and see if we can increase the amount of storage we're allowed to use. So if you start going over this, I'm pretty sure it becomes quite protected as soon as you pass the limit. So then all your analysis that is running is going to crash, saying, I can't write this file because it's right to And there's a similar one also for core hours. So if you type probably info, you'll receive information about core hour usage. So for every project that you're a member of, you can see that we've used this much, and we're allowed to use this much. And it's specified per user as well, so you can see who's been using everything. This is a nice program. So you get 2,000 core hours a month, but it's not like the 25th that everyone gets new hours. So we calculate a sliding window during the last 30 days. So what's your accumulated core hour usage during the last 30 days? And if you type Proy plot, it will show you a plot of your core hour usage during the last 30 days. So the area underneath this curve is your core hour usage. And as long as the area underneath this curve is below your uh, allocated limit, so 2,000 hours, we're fine. You still get to submit jobs with high priority and stuff like that. But if the area underneath the curve is larger than your allocation, then you get a lower priority queue. So when I think, okay, so when do I get more hours? And that answer is when, when things start falling off the edge over here, that's when you get hours back. And I don't exactly know the time resolution. It could be like per second or minute or something like that, that it calculates this thing. But if you know that three weeks ago I ran a lot, then you're probably going to get two hours back in a week. <coughs> and using this tool, you can uh, visualize it so you can see. So now we come to the important part how we use resources efficiently. Because as you asked, how do you know the first time? You have no idea. It's a new software, you never run it before. Should you book a whole node or one core? So we made a program called the job stats. So you type job stats dash p for I want to plot the images for this, otherwise you only get text output, and then which project you're interested in looking at. So this will print out one plot for each job that you run during the last 30 days. And it can look something like this. If it looks like this, I'm very happy. This means that the blue line up here is the CPU usage of this computer when you were running. You can see that the scale here, the blue scale, goes up to 1600%. So that means this job booked 16 cores. And it used all of them, all of the time. Here it was a tiny dip, but you know, that happens. As long as you're like above 70% average usage, we're happy. We don't require 100%. All other scientific domains, they, all, they run at almost 100%, so we should too, but you know, we have more beginner users, so it's more understandable that we're a bit lower in efficiency. The black line down here that you can't really see, it's just a flat line, it's the memory usage of this program. So it used almost no memory during the whole job, but that's fine. I mean, we can't book memory separate from the compute cores. If it looks like this, we are not happy. This means that you booked a whole computer with 16 cores. You did use all 16, but only for a tiny amount of time. The most annoying part about this is that the program that they ran probably said, I'm a multi-core program, I can use multiple cores. You can, but only for some part of the program. So if I were to recommend this project, they should only have booked two cores, because that is what this program could use sustainably all the time. You still would have to squeeze down all these calculations still has to happen. So the job might take twice as long to run. So instead of 800 minutes, it may take 1,500, 1,600 minutes. But it would be running at 100% all of the time. If it looks like this, 
were also happy. They don't use the CPU. They only use one single core of all the 16 like they booked. But Slurm doesn't allow us to schedule uh, bookings for RAM separate from cores. So if you want to use all the memory in the machine, you have to book all of the cores in the machine. And if there are 16 cores or 20 cores in the machine, for every core that you book, you get uh, a similar percentage of the RAM. So if you book half the cores, you get half the RAM. And if you use more than your allocated RAM, will kill your job because then you're stealing RAM from someone else. So this is also why you might want to overestimate your core usage sometimes. If you know that the memory usage of my program is very unpredictable, sometimes it spikes, like this one goes up a lot at the end here, then you might book a whole node. And if we see that your jobs is using a varied amount of RAM every single time, we know that you can't really predict, then it's okay to be inefficient. But if we can see that RAM usage is always down here, and the CPU usage is always down here, then we're going to contact you and say, no, you, you can have more hours, or we're going to throttle your jobs or something. So because we have a queue of people waiting for, to use the computers, if you're standing running jobs like this, that means that you're using computers, but you're not really using them, where people wait. That's much good. Because next time, it's going to be you who's waiting in a queue one wants to finish your jobs quickly, but then someone else is trying to efficient. That's also a shame because this computer costs the 10 million crowns, and if we're only using 60% of it, that means 4 million crowns is just wasted. Could we use those for something better? So, take home messages. The difference between user accounts and projects. So, Docmax only the projects have uh, resources. You can only be a member of a project and use those resources. You don't have any on your own. Login nodes are not for running your analysis. If you do, uh, we have automatic software that will just notice that you're using too much. And it, will, it will change something called the, uh, the nice value of your processes, which means that everything else will get but It will run super slow. So it's never going to finish. When we, when we made that so that you don't disturb on the analysis of the login nodes. And Slurm is what gives you access to the compute nodes, and you specify a project that you're a member of, and then you can use the nodes that you want. Use Interactive for testing and developing your scripts for like small test jobs. So if you have like one single thing you're going to run, and maybe it's not worth writing all scripts for it, then you'll start in one manual. Don't ask for more resources than you will use, because then someone else will go without and have to wait. And then you have this job script that's has the job settings. You have to load modules in your job script to be able to use the software. Then you have all the bash code. So CD to the right directory, you run the right programs. Make can run as many programs as you like. There's no limit on how long a script file can be. So now we're going to practice using Opmax.